Um, Matplotlib is just visualization library. The visualizations are not interactive, but they are very simple to create. And it's a very powerful module. So that's the one that we're gonna like consider as being the default here uh, for the course. Uh, and basically you import it. Uh, yeah, that there's a, yeah. So I'm importing it like import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. I won't talk too much about this, but basically pyplot is a sub module of matplotlib, which is this, the, the module that we're going to use for this notebook. And I'm renaming it as PLT just because PLT is, is easier to, to, to write than matplotlib.pyplot. And uh, the reason why uh, we're using this specific sub-module of matplotlib is because it gives us a little bit of an easy interface to, to work with. So this is the one I'm gonna use. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff you can do with matplotlib, of course, but this is just supposed to be a very quick introduction, right? Um, the easiest way to create a plot here is to call plt.plot. Um, as you can see, this is kind of like a Swiss army knife. It, it lets you do a lot of stuff. Uh, just take a look at this code, for example, where I'm uh, plotting. Uh, I'm creating this Y array by calling this random.rand function from NumPy that creates an array full of random numbers. And I'm asking for 10 random numbers in this case. So that's what you see here. It's, a, it's an array with 10 uh, random numbers. I, uh, this is an interesting example here of vectorized operations. So you can see that I'm summing two to the array. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is because if I just call like this, I get, I get numbers between um, zero and one. So you, I get, if I just do it like this, I say, okay, give me 10 random numbers. Since NumPy doesn't know like what random numbers I want, then it just gives me random numbers between zero and one. And then I can, for example, sum two, and then uh, basically now my numbers are basically between two and three. It doesn't matter. It's just an example of a vectorized operation that you can do here. Uh, and then I plot it. And it couldn't be easier. I mean, just look at this. It's, it's super mega easy. So I'm just saying plot the array of Y, and then I'm giving it a little bit of a format specification here. I'm saying, I wanna use circles and I wanna use lines. So for example, if I do it like this, then the circles are gone. And actually, if I didn't do anything, this would be exactly what I would see anyway, because by, by default, matplotlib just supposes that I'm doing a line plot, right? But if I do something like this, then I'm saying I want lines, but I also want circles. And if I actually just, just gave this, then it would be only points and not lines anymore. So you can see how this is super flexible. You can do a lot of stuff. This is actually very similar to what MATLAB has. If you ever worked with MATLAB, you are familiar with this. It's basically the same. Uh, yeah. And, and as you can see here, one interesting thing is that I did not have to, to define the x-axis here. So basically NumPy just assumed the x-axis here as being like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, because I didn't give it to, to, to it, I didn't say anything, so it just assumed. But I could have uh, done, I could have given uh, something, some other specification here. Let's try to make something a little bit more interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically here what I'm doing is, I'm creating a, a T array here. And the way I'm creating it is by, by calling this, this function called A range which is uh, basically I'm saying, I want numbers between zero and five, and I want them to be, uh, and I want them in uh, steps of 0 0.2. So basically I have zero, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 8, 1, 1 1.2, and so on and so forth, until I get to five, but not including five, as you can see here. It stops at 4.8. So beginning and step. And then I get this array here, T. And now I'm plotting three things. And this is an interesting thing for you guys to know that when you're plotting using plt.plot, you can simply call plt.plot multiple times, one after the other, and they will be basically stacked on top of each other, okay? So for example, here I have, I, I plotted T. Actually, you know what? Let me comment this and show you how it works. So first I plotted T. And I define that I want it to be red and uh, to be dashed, so a dashed line. And then this is what we see, right? 
basically because, I mean, this is just, just evenly spaced numbers. And then I said, okay, I want to plot now t squared, right? So t to the power of two here. And uh, uh, please uh, remember here that this thing here, this is not like a function call or anything. This is actually t squared. So if I were to actually do something else like t, I could, I could call it t2 like this, and I can print it and you can see that this t2, Oh, you know, let me comment this. T2 is actually an array. It's not, it's not that I'm, I'm defined that I want T to be squared or something like this. I'm actually squaring all elements of T and making a new array out of that. So then you have 0, 0 0.04, 0 0.16, and so on and so forth. But uh, I just wanted to, you guys to make sure you understand that when I call this, this is an actually new array that has all elements from T squared, okay? And then you have this, uh, and now you can see that I, we have two things here, two, two uh, stacked on top of each other. And then I do the same thing, but now I want t to the power of three. And I specify that I want it to be green. I want it to have little circles and I want it to have a line. Uh, and then you see the results here. So basically three different plots stacked on top of each other in the same figure. And always remember to call plt.show because this is, what, this is what allows you to stack these three plots on top of each other before you call PLT show. The moment you, pull, you call PLT show, basically they're like offloaded or something. If, you, if, you, if I were to do something like this, then it, wouldn't, it, it would work a little bit uh, differently. You see, if I do PLT.show and then I do something else and I do PLT.show again, then you see the first one and the second one. Because every time you call plt.shows, you're basically saying, okay, uh, do it. And then let's start again with the next one. Right. Oh yeah, these are the stuff that I've seen. Yeah, the syntax format for these things, I'm not gonna go over that. You can look at that up in the documentation. There's like millions of different syntax that you can use here to define all kinds of different symbols. Uh, and uh, colors and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I won't, of course, talk about that, but you can look at the documentation for a full description here. Actually, if I open here, you can see uh, um, somewhere. Notes, I think it's... Uh, I ch yeah, I think it's... Yeah, here, you see? this one, notes, format strings, and then uh, markers, you have a bunch of different markers, line styles, colors, and so on. So you can take a look at that later and then go crazy with this. Oh uh, yeah, and of course we can add legends to this because without a legend, this looks completely horrible. And also uh, titles to the, the access and so on and so forth. So if we take the same thing I did before in the first one, and I take, and I, uh, one thing that I added here was I'm calling after I plot, so I plot T and I give the format and then I say label equals T. This label is what goes into the legend over here. So T or T squared or T cubed, this is what goes into the legend over here. Uh, and then you call plt.legend, that's it. That's all you need to do. And then the legend appears. Actually, you know, I'm gonna comment this and then show it to you. Yeah, so you see, this is exactly the same as we had before the, with the addition that I added a label to each plot and then I called plt.legend and then it puts the legend over here. And you know, if you don't say anything, I want the legends to be here or there, then it just kind of like looks for the best possible place to put it. But sometimes it, it's not very good. So then you have to actually specify it yourself. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk too much about this, but who knows, but who knows maybe next time. And then I define some other stuff here just to make the plot a little bit uh, more beautiful. I, I, I put the title, matplotlib example, and then it appears over here, as you can see. Then I call X label and Y label in order to define labels for the axis. So you can see like the X label is T because that's what it is here. And the Y label is, I just call it FT because it's some function applied to, to T in the Y axis, right? And then you see it here. So just, just by looking at this, you can see that, you know, very easily you can make 99% of the plots you're gonna need for the whole course, just by going up to this point, to be honest. 
Uh, right, okay, cool. Evan made a comment here saying that these look a lot like MATLAB, but in MATLAB you have to hold on if you want multiple lines in a plot. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very, uh, I, I knew, know a little bit a bit of Mat, MATLAB, but it's been a long time. Right, so up to this point, like I said, you could do probably like most of the plots you need to do for the entire course just by going, uh, just by using this. Um, there will be cases where, when you will have uh, to, um, there will be cases when you will have to customize a little bit, but the truth is that most of the plots could be done just by going up, up to this point. Uh, David asked what was that show again? And uh, yeah, Ali, answered yeah so basically when you uh, david when you call pld.show you basically saying okay offload everything that i've done so far and then start a new one so for example if you if if we go back here and i and i took this call of show here and i put it here for example then you're going to see two plots the first one has the first two and the second one has only the third one yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't remember the, the MATLAB calls, but I guess, yeah. So I'm going to skip this one because it's not super important. You can make bar charts very, very, very easily just by calling plt.bar instead of plt.plot. So you could use this to, to do, like to, to, I don't know, to put scores, for example, for different models. Uh, and the way you do it is you just make a list with the stuff that you want to have in the x-axis put the values here, like red equals 20, green equals 30, blue, blue equals 100. Then you call plt.bar, x-axis, y-axis, names and values. Red equals 20, green equals 30, and blue equals 100. And I put also a list here with the colors RGB, so RGB, uh, and title and so on. So it's also like, couldn't be simpler to do. Of course, again, if you want to do something super um, super complicated and super nice, then you're going to have to dig in in the documentation of each of these function calls and then find out like what are the arguments, what are the stuff, what's the other stuff that you can do. But basically, if you just wanted to do, I just want to do a very simple bar chart. Let's say, for example, red, green, and blue are three different models that you have trained. And let's say you want to compare the accuracies for these three models, then you could simply do a very simple bar chart and, and plot the, the values of the accuracies here. That would be one way to do that. And uh, keep in mind that sometimes less is more, actually most of the time less is more. So if you can do the same thing with a simpler graph than you can do with a complex graph, then go for the simpler graph. Um, you can do histograms. Histograms are a little bit like bar charts, but uh, they show distributions of variables. I cannot really go very much details with this, but basically uh, the histogram here, I'm calling it with plt.hist, and I hope you know what a histogram is, but basically I'm, uh, I'm asking for 50 bins. So there are 50 little rectangles here that show like how many points are in each of these regions. That's what a histogram does, right? And since I'm, uh, since I'm simulating here or sampling here a normal distribution, then you see a normal distribution here in the histogram. Uh, and anyway, I mean, I, I, I cannot do, I cannot talk uh, much more about this, unfortunately, because we're out of time and I still have some stuff to talk about. I just hope that this example can be useful in the future when you want to um, do your own histograms. And if you don't know what a histogram is, then I guess you can uh, look it up because it's a very common, very useful thing to do. Then another useful thing that we can do with uh, matplotlib is heat maps, which are basically like full uh, pictures of, of pixels uh, with as many pixels as you want, like with any resolution that you want. Uh, in this case, what I did here, if you, if you look at the code is, I basically, first of all, generated a, an array of random values. It's a rank two array, has two axes. Each axis has 10 values. And then it's here if you are curious to, to know the values. 
as you can see, I did not uh, do anything with the results. So it's all between zero and one. And I have a hundred values here because it's 10 by 10. And then it couldn't, as you can see here, it couldn't be simpler. I'm, I'm calling plt.im show, which basically is like image show. And I give X here. And then, so Matplotlib knows that, okay, I, I gotta take X and I gotta map I gotta map these these values to pixels. I say pixel, but of course this is the, there are many pixels here. But let's say just it's a resolution of ten by ten. So let's just consider that each of these is a, is like a big pixel, right? Basically, when you call a, a image show, you're, you're saying yeah, Matplotlib understands that you have they have to take the x that you just gave it, and it will map the value of each x to a certain color. And the way it maps is by using a color map. Now I could simply not have done anything here and this is what I would see. And the reason I would see this is because this is the default color map. It's called Veritas. Uh, it's a very good color map actually if you guys wanna use it as a default, there's absolutely no problem with that because it's really, really good. Um, so that would, you see that it, it could, couldn't be simpler than this, it, literally. Plot plt dot m show x and then pff, you have a you have a heat map here period right so that's super 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 simple but of course in my case I said okay I want to change the color map because I want another color map so I'm I'm call I'm using this color map called plasma which is available in this in this module here matplotlib dot cm uh, you know because I, there are many of them. Uh, I, I left a link here to the tutorial for color maps in Matplotlib and really take a look at this because this tutorial is one of the most amazing things uh, that you can read about color maps. It's amazing. So really take a look at this tutorial on, on color maps because it's really, really good. And then that's how you do a color map. There are many ways, there are many things you could do with this. Like for example, in this case, as you can see here, like since I uh, made a, a much, much uh, larger array here, because now we're talk, uh, I have a, an array that is 100 by 100. So the picture looks much better than the previous one, right? Because this looks very rough, but this one looks actually quite, quite cool. So this is just, this is just a way to show, to show a picture given that you have an array. And in this case, for example, I just, I just generated this array by computing the distance from each cell to the center of the matrix. So basically I have a, a, an empty array here of n by n, and then I go through all the, the arrays that I have, and I, sorry, the cells of this array, and I compute the distance from that, from that specific cell to the center and the center in this case is just n divided by two because this is this is n and this is n divided by two in both axes. Uh, and this is what you see. So you can see this in this case that it is very bright in the center and very dark towards the borders because this is the color map that I'm using. I'm using this color map called yellow, green, blue. So basically means it starts with yellow, passes through green and then goes to blue. Okay, so this is why we see it like this. The, the larger the distance from the center, the larger the value of the color map. And this color map happens to go like this. And I could, I could do something different. I could call it like plasma, and then you would see a different thing because you're mapping the values to different colors. And in this case, plasma goes from dark purple to, to yellow. So that's why you see like low values, large values, okay? In this case, you see that I defined the color map here in a different way that I did here. Two different options, you can do both. Uh, I just like to show different uh, possibilities for you. Right, and then I was asked by Jonas to talk to you a little bit about how to plot decision boundaries. And the way you plot decision boundaries is by using this imshow method because I don't know, probably you've never seen a decision boundary. So let me just show the picture uh, first of all. This is what a decision ba boundary looks like. It's a way to say, look, I have all these points um, and these points are like points that, I'm, that I want to classify. And then 
I want to plot the decision boundaries and, and to plot the decision boundaries, I have actually to try to classify all the points in the, um, in the grid to, to try to, to predict which class they are from, right? So if, you, if you've seen a little bit about supervised learning, then you know that supervised learning means you take some data and you try to predict the class of that data or the label of the data, right? So in, that, in this case, if we consider the classes or the labels as being just like blue or red, then the decision boundary here would basically say, okay, what if I tried to classify all the pixels in this map here? Where, how would they be classified? Uh, and this would be like the result of this. It's a kind of a, it's something that you guys are gonna have to do uh, throughout the course. Uh, and I was asked to show you how to do it. So I will just, I will send you the, the example later so you can take a look at this uh, and you will see how I'm doing this here using actually mshow because mshow shows the values for all the cells of the grid, right? So I'm just gonna leave the example here. You can take a look at it later. Uh, and, and then we, we move on to, to scikit-learn because there's a lot of stuff to do. Uh, to talk about scikit-learn, which is much more interesting than, than this. Finally, subplots also is something that uh, I think is very important. You guys are gonna use it a lot. Uh, so basically, in the same way that we did before where we that had the show and we could, well, anyway, uh, before I showed you that if you call show a few times, then you get n new figures. In, uh, what you can do with subplot is to actually arrange these figures in a grid in a nice way so that it looks better than simply having a lot of individual figures hanging around, right? So subplots will allow you to generate many different figures and put them in a nice little organized way. And the example is here, you, you can take a look later. I think it's very self-explainable, but basically you call subplot and then this one, three, one here is very interesting because it means one row, three columns, and, and the current subplot is the number one. So it's this one. And then you plot it normally. And then it, it appears here. Then you call PLT does subplot one, three again, because it's one row, three columns, but the current one is number two. So then you do whatever you want here. And then it appears, it appears here because this is number two. Then you go to the next one, you do again, one row, three columns, number three. So it's this one. And then you plot everything you want and then it appears here. And when you call show, everything gets drawn at the same time in this grid that you defined. And the way that you defined it was simply by calling this one, three, one, one, three, two, and one, three, three, before you started plotting each of the subplots. Couldn't be simpler. Take a look later, try to do this. If it doesn't work, you let me know uh, if, if you have some problems, but it literally could have been simpler than this. And then I left here also a very, very nice uh, example of a scatterplot matrix, which is using subplots. I will not talk about this now, but it's something that you guys might, if, you, if you're curious, take a look at the code of this and uh, to, to have an ex a good example of how to use subplots to do something that's very, very complicated, but also very nice. Uh, 